Hi, I'm Jay, welcome to the workshop, and today we're going to be talking about 12 volt wiring. Now I've got a few calling switches to wire up on a mate's Land Rover, uh, and I've also made him a bit of a relay fuse board type thing because uh, we're going to be adding some uh, external lights mainly um, to this Land Rover so I thought this would be a good opportunity to um, tell you some tips and tricks I guess um, on the kind of stuff that I picked up along the way. I think the first thing that I've picked up quite quickly is that you need the right tools. If you're going to be doing something like an Overland build you're going to be doing a lot of uh, 12 volt electrical stuff. Um, lights, fridges, outlets. It's a lot of wiring. I don't think people quite understand when they first um, start out. So it's worth investing. Not the best gear out there or the, the highest tech stuff out there. Just the simple kind of basics that will help you in the long run. For example, I have this uh, little um, battery lug um, crimp tool for the thicker gauge wiring um, and all it is is a spring loaded punch and die which you then hit with a hammer and it crimps um, a battery terminal lug or winch wiring something along them lines. Without this um, it will be very difficult to um, achieve a very good crimp. First thing I do is pick up that this was relatively cheap, I think it was like 20 quid, 30 quid, something along them lines. Uh, other things I would suggest as well, um, a lot of people go with these kind of crimp tools because um, they are cheap. However, uh, a ratcheting set, like that, um, gives you a much um, better quality crimp because they're actually uh, formed to the crimp sizes and uh, the actual cr uh, crimp surface is much wider as well so you get a nice even crimp along the whole connector plus because it's ratcheted you know you're getting the same um, kind of pound of torque I guess I don't know I don't know what the, uh, the right way of saying that would be um, every time you crimp so crimp tool and the other thing Automatic wire strippers. Um, they just save so much time and just makes it a lot easier to strip your cable. A decent morning mirror, you're gonna need one of these um, for installing, checking that your your connections are have actually been made, and some electrical diagnostics, which you probably will have to do at some point. So you can get all this stuff for uh, under 100 quid if you shop around, maybe 150 quid if you want to get a bit better quality. But yeah, you can you can set yourself up for all your 12 volt needs tool wise for around about 150 quid. My next tip would be to heat shrink every crimp connection you make. Uh, we use, or we've just started using, um, the adhesive lined um, heat shrink, which a helps uh, moisture ingress or prevents moisture ingress because it is an actual physical you know, seal around the uh, one end of the crimp connector and two, because it's adhesive lined it actually attaches the, the outer sheathing of the cable or the wire uh, to the um, crimp so you've got an extra mechanism there which is helping the, um, the wire not, not to be pulled out of the crimp if you get what I mean. Um, so yeah, it's worth the extra little bit of effort. Um, the adhesive lined heat shrinking isn't actually that expensive, um, but it just takes an extra step. Um, and we do this inside and out of the vehicle. A lot of people only heat, heat shrink the connectors on the outside of the vehicle or in the engine bay. We do inside and out. Again, mainly for the security of that crimp connector, because I've had quite, uh, I've had a few instances that uh, the cable have actually pulled out of the crimp connector. Um, which is obviously not very good when you're out on the trail and you need a certain piece of equipment and your crimp connection fails. Next one is, is a mistake that I fell foul to um, and some people do it, some people don't. I now don't do it for this exact reason and as is to try and splice two uh, cables 
into one connector. Again, this might be a uh, preference of some people. Some people, like I said, some people do do it, some people don't. Uh, but what I found is if you try and daisy chain two connections together, say if you had you're running a load of um, earths for a switch panel, an illuminated switch panel, for example. Uh, you need to daisy chain them all together rather than running loads of separate earths. Um, what a lot of people do is they'll strip wire like that and they'll twist the two together and then stuff it into a single crim connector like so. Is your end result. Now that might be fine, um, especially if you're using relatively small gauge wiring. However, connections like this have actually failed me, mainly because um, if you're especially using slightly thicker cable, over time that can actually work work loose and fall out the bottom. I've had that a few times, um, nothing too drastic, it was mainly on the switch gear side of it, I might lose the illumination on it or something along them lines. Um, there's not a lot I would daisy chain together anymore. Um, I try and run separate earths for separate pieces of equipment as much as I can. Um, however, what we do instead is we use a piggyback connector. Now this is a piggyback connector. Um, and what it does is it, it's a female spade with a male spade on, on the end of it. So what you can do is if I just try here. You can put the piggyback connector on first. That will then go on to your spade terminal of your calling switch, for example, a relay, um, anything like, like that. And then to piggyback, let's take your other cable or your wire crimp another spade connector on. I normally use these fully insulated spade connectors. And then plug the piggyback connector. You've now got a two piggyback, uh, two connections onto the same terminal, which have their own separate crimp. Now there is scenarios you can't use this if you're, you know, this connection is a little bit thicker. Uh, then obviously the standard connection would be if you if you stuff two wires into the same crimp. Um, and obviously this is bare. However, what I normally do is just slip a piece of heat shrink over the uh, the bare metal, so your isolate uh, insulating, sorry that bare material, but that's how we do it. One issue I had with the Hilux install is I didn't have a lot of space to put things like fuses, relays, and the rest of the assortment stuff that were easy to access. Um, so what I did is I shoved them any location it could be. For example, my fuse board, my main fuse board for all the interior um, components are actually underneath the switch panel which was great when I didn't have very many switches in use. Now I have a few more switches, there's a lot more wiring in there. So it's a lot more difficult to get to the fuse board. So on this install, like I mentioned before, I've made a fuse and relay panel. Now these are quite, should I say, popular design. Um, if you go on YouTube and type in 12 volt fuse panel, something like that, you're almost guaranteed to come across a similar design to this. However, this can drop um, right next to the battery underneath the seat in the Land Rover. And as soon as you take the seat off, you can see any fuses that are blown, all your relays that you need, uh, and then you've also got these circuit breakers. Now, the circuit breakers are brilliant pieces of qu uh, kit. They are worth the extra, little, uh, the extra couple of quid that you'd pay for them over something like a maxi fuse because they are resettable. Um, so what I usually use these for is for high current items, uh, you're talking 50 amps plus. Um, mainly 
in this instance we're actually feeding this um, fuse board which takes in one main supply and splits it into 12 different circuits. So our main supply in is going to be rated to 100 amps because that's exactly what the maximum of this fuse panel can take. So our feed from the battery will be protected from this um, circuit breaker here. Another key thing that has kind of evolved um, throughout my wiring experience, I guess, is the way I protect cables. Um, all too often I see installs where, bare, when I call bare cabling, bare cabling seeing something like this, is running over sharp corners, it's running through um, holes that aren't grommeted, you know, it's it's rubbing up against other cables, uh, or it's up right near some um, sources of heat like your exhaust or even your engine. Um, that is where a lot of wiring f failures come from. That and undersizing wires, which I'm not going to get into that. Uh, if you want to know the basics of that, tell me in the comments below and I'll do a video about um, cable sizing and 12 volt wiring basics. I used to use a lot of this conduit stuff, which you can see it here. Um, it's great, you can get it in split and unsplit, and this is, it has its place, um, however I use quite a lot of it internally, and it's, it's not very easy to route internally. If you're routing this through a engine bay, for example, brilliant. We've actually, you can actually get waterproof connectors for the end of these, so we've got one of these running through our bulkhead. Uh, I think it's a two inch one, so it's quite a big bit, bit bigger than this and it runs across the top of our engine bay. I've recently been using this uh, braided mesh stuff and it's brilliant because it expands when you put more and more cabling in it and it just looks a bit more professional. Because you, as you can see on the um, relay board that I've just made up here, you can heat shriek the ends together and it just gives it that extra bit of plastic protection over the original sheath or you can group up a bundle of cables and create one big multi-cord cable, so to speak. And I guess my last point, um, and again, this is just a preference for me, you don't have to do this, but I invest in good quality switches. Um, in my previous job, we did quite a lot of 12 volt electrical stuff for site equipment, um, and quite a lot of the time, the, the issues electrical wires that we'd come across would be um, switches that I just busted. So on the Hilux and why I suggest um, with any overland vehicle that's going through well you think about our vehicles are going through quite a lot of harsh environments so what I uh, suggest is calling switches. Now calling switches are used a lot in the marine industry um, because of their robust robustness and they're, they're actually starting to make their way into some OEM um, plant uh, machinery now, some of the high-end JCBs, etc., using very similar style switches. Now, what these are is the, these can be waterproof. So, if this was a panel of a uh, boat, for example, they can be actually waterproofed from the rain and stuff from above. And you also have these laser-etched rocket switches, which is really, really nice. These, the top row here, are illuminated with your um, side light be main beam or whatever uh, source you'd like, your interior light, right? anything like that. And the bottom here is an indication like when it's it turned on and off. Uh, but I really like these because they're rated to something ridiculous um, switch cycles uh, and you can get quite a nice uh, variety of the rocker covers as well. But again, I'm not gonna go too far into these because it's a whole different video. Um, but if you wanna learn a bit more about these calling switches, then tell me in the comments below and I'll do a video just on column switches, why not? So there's just a handful of tips and tricks, so to speak, um, of how I go about my wiring. Uh, if you guys have any other suggestions, again, I'm not saying this is the how to, this is how the way you have to do it, but other people do things differently. Um, then if you have a different method, then please tell me in the comments below, you know, I'm always up for learning new things. Uh, and if there's anything in particular you would like to, for me to make a video on, then leave that in the comments below as well. But until then, thanks for watching, and I shall see you later.